Today's a very special day. It's across the entire globe where Christians gather to celebrate the foundation of our faith. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We're the only religion with an empty tomb. And the empty tomb is the foundation of all of our hope and all of our joy. And this morning we gather to celebrate this great truth. And my goal is to say, what does that mean 2,000 years later for you as you sit here this morning? How does this have any bearing on my life today? And my prayer and desire is to attempt to answer that today by using the, the words of, of one who, who out of uh, fear uh, denied that he even knew Jesus three times, the apostle Peter, when he thought he was going to end up being crucified or taken into prison as well. He, he denied three times, I don't even know the man, and then he had to watch him hang on a cross. He saw and, and spent time with him after Jesus was raised from the dead. Peter was lovingly restored by Jesus Christ in John 21 for his destructive denials that he gave to the Son of God. And then he became one of the great pillars of the early church, a real foundation. This one who was hiding in a room then when he was on the cross afterwards in fear that now they might come after him. And all of a sudden he would break out and begin to preach Jesus Christ, he said, is alive from the dead at any cost, even to the point of death. Nero is going to crucify Peter and he will hang him upside down on a cross for that name that he says is risen, I will die for this name. So if you'll turn with me to Peter, we're going to be looking at chapter one this morning. We've been studying this for a year as a church and I, I think I finally understand this book. And so I want to preach it again. And as I pondered the resurrection, I kept going to verses and looking at them. And I just kept coming back to this verse. I can't get past this thought, so I'm just going to go with it. And I, I hope it will bless your soul the way it has mine this week. And so why this verse? If you'll look with me, 1 Peter 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope. How? Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And so good news is we're just going to look at one verse this morning. The bad news is it took me a couple hours when I preached it the first time. So get ready. That word that Peter will choose to tell us what this resurrection means to us today it's hope. It's a living hope. And as I've been journeying through First Peter, I'm seeing what the, the foundation and pillar of this is to the Christian life. We, we have to have hope. It's been said that a man can live only eight days without water, 50 days without food, and only a few seconds without hope. It's probably the most important thing that you have this morning is you must have hope. We can't live without it. And so we have to have a hope or everything just is gone and it falls apart. And so I want to love you this morning. And I want to give you a hope that this world can't take away. I don't want to make you miserable. I want to bless you with a living hope that will go past the grave and into eternal life. I want you to have a living hope. Wherever, whatever you are sitting under this morning, Whatever you've walked in with and whatever burdens you are carrying, whatever you have had to journey in this life, I want to give you a hope this morning that's a living hope, and it can't die, and it can never be taken away. And so I offer you the hope that has come in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's a living hope, and it has absolutely changed my life and millions and millions of people since Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. And so I pray, let's go before God and ask that no one would walk out of this room this morning without a living hope. Father, we come to you and we're aware of the one who's seated at your right hand even now, the one who was dead, the one who has risen, the one who now sits in all authority the one who all, all are subject to, the one who created this world. Father, we come to you and we realize the only way we draw near to you is through the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And so I thank you, Lord, that you have called us here this morning. Lord, and you've called each one of us here now to hear about a living hope. And God, I'm asking you to do what no man can do. I'm asking you to cause every soul in this room to be born again to this living hope. God, would you do that? Would you do that in our midst? We, we cry and ask you to do this work of mercy upon every heart in this room. And God, let every believer be refreshed again in this living hope that we have in Jesus Christ. I love the empty tomb, and I love Jesus Christ. God bless us this morning in the word of God, we pray. Amen. Well, I wanted to start by way of introduction with maybe a few thoughts on hope. Hope, as I observe kind of our current world, and especially in America today, I really see a people who are losing hope. I think we were more hopeless than we've really ever been as a country. I remember when Jimmy Carter preached his famous address to the American people, and, he, and I guess I don't remember it because I was little and I didn't pay attention to politics then, and I really don't now a whole lot. But there's a movie called The Miracle. It's a great movie. You need to go watch it sometime about when we won the Olympics in the 1980s. But in it, they quote Jimmy Carter when he's preaching and sharing a message, not preaching. This is the first time he said in our country that we believe that the days of our future will not be as bright as the days of our past. And I would say today, very few are optimistic anymore that this is going to get better. As the decay and the brokenness of our country is devolving at a very rapid pace, believer and unbeliever alike are in agreement on this. We found something we could agree on. We're all looking with our eyes and we're saying this doesn't have a lot of hope. Prosperity did not serve us as a country the way that we had hoped. And we kind of lost seeking to be a nation under God. Now we can't even agree which God we can't even agree if there is one. We're an empty people that the abundance of this land and all the opportunity, it didn't fill the void of our hearts. It didn't cause and solve our real problem. It didn't satisfy. We're empty. And the fruit of the last 200 years in America are now a bunch of people without a lot of hope. Laura and I like to joke about a sweet family, whenever they have their new little babies, there's such a big grin and they're just so happy and you, you don't ever want to just kind of smirk and go, do they realize what's coming? <laughs> I just, as a pastor, during the baby dedication, I always feel tempted to say, do you realize uh, what's ahead? But you just kind of want to join them in their joy and celebration. But I think we've lost hope in our nation. I think we've lost hope that the government is going to be able to fix this. I think we've lost hope in being united, a united nation under God with a racism that's ripping our country apart and Republicans and Democrats who can just fight on every issue. We have lost common unity and just a common decency. And there's mass shootings and people killing each other and murdering babies. There's a self-centeredness that's on an all-time high in this country. John MacArthur, a preacher in California, said that if everyone told the truth in one day, our whole country would fall apart. It's all built on lies and deception. The common graces that were built into this nation are gone. An abortion, we can't even define marriage. The family design and the common grace that it is is broken and falling apart. We can't even agree on what bathrooms we should use. The truth has eroded into a relativism as whatever you think is right is right. Drug use and alcohol are at an all-time high, and the death toll from it is staggering. And I could go on and on and on, but most people I talk to, believer and unbeliever alike, agree that it's broken, and most people have lost hope, especially with our young people. And the social media has opened them up to a world on a daily basis and they're taking their lives at an alarming rate because they can't find hope in this broken world. And some of you are going, thanks, Barnabas. I had lost hope. I had a little bit of hope, and now you just kind of squelched it. I was hoping on Easter I could hear a message of hope. Thanks, Pastor Murphy. Well, that's my goal. 
not to squelch it, but to, to take the wrong hope away, and I want to give you a real hope that can't go away. You see, I, I don't want you to live on false hopes that don't work. This morning, I want to give you a true, living, beautiful hope, because our false hopes are, are what have led us to no hope. And you can't have a true hope, you can't have a living hope until your false hopes are thrown down and given up. And so the first thing you need to see is that your hope is a dying one. Peter is going to talk about a living hope this morning, as opposed to dead hopes. And that's why our country is hopeless. We build our hope on dead hopes. The whole thing was built on something that would die. And all of our lives were built upon that. And so we come into this world, and God made us in his image. And we've been made for God. That's the way you were designed. You're, you're an image bearer of God. You have minds. You can reason and affections. You can love and a will that you can choose. You are so beautiful. You are made in the image of God. And you've been made for God. He made us to have fellowship. Adam and God walked in the garden in, in fellowship. And it's so beautiful how God made us. And something happened called a fall with the garden and Adam and Eve when they sinned. They took the whole human race with them. And the minute God comes down the garden, Adam's hiding. He's naked and he's ashamed because now he realizes there's something wrong. I can't be in the presence of a God like this. I, I need to hide. And this is all of humanity's sense is we're running from God and we're hiding and we all have this void in our hearts because you've been made for God. So you've been made to have a, be in a relationship with God, and you will never find peace until you're brought back into a relationship with God. Augustine in the fourth century said, the heart will always be restless until uh, it finds its rest in thee, O God. You, you've been made for God, and you're never going to find peace until you're brought back to him. And so there's the problem with all of humanity is that you're made in his image, and we're trying to fill that void with everything other than God. So everything is a false hope because the only way you can have a true living hope is to be brought back to God and to have him as that anchor and that center of hope. And so we begin this journey of trying to fill the God-shaped void. And we look at this world without faith and we look at it with our five senses and we, we want to, to fill our hopes with those five senses and we look to this world to fill the void, and we chase everything and anything, maybe this will fill it. I spent a lifetime chasing something that could fill this void, and every time I thought it would, it was wind. That didn't work. Something that will give me hope. I can't live without hope, or I'll just be a zombie. I had to find hope, and I looked in anything and everything I could get my hands on, to fill that, and all I did was get emptier and emptier and emptier and running out of false hopes. So if you will slow down this morning and maybe just love people and talk with them, we're unified in trying to find a hope in something. And if you'll talk for just a little bit, you'll hear what their hope is in because what your hope is in will fill your speech and your life and your actions. And so everyone has that thing that they're looking at that will finally give them hope. And I'm going to share with you a couple of things that I've come across in my journey as a pastor and in my own life. The first hope is I, just good health. And I want to put my hope in that. I'm going to spend all of my days trying to get good health. And, and we have a whole billion dollar industry now outside the medical of you know, the right mushrooms, cauliflower, it just goes on and on the list of how I can get good health. And that's my hope. My hope is to stay in good health or to get over this disease or chronic illness and find that. And, and so health is a big hope in our country. I just want to get married. I work with singles, the college and career, and it's very easy to make your hope, I just got to get married. And if I get married, life's going to be worth it. Then I'm going to have that hope filled. Or once you're married, if I can just get a good marriage, then I'll be happy. And I'm going to go to every seminar and read every book and just keep trying because my hope is in a good marriage. My hope is in my children. My hope is that they will become what I couldn't be. 
that they would do better than I did, and that people will smile at me because I got good little kids, and my hope is in my children. My hope is in becoming something or someone. I'm going to get that job. I'm going to get that degree. I'm going to show everybody who made fun of me in grade school that I'm something. I got a hope in proving that I'm a somebody. I got a hope I'm going to make the world a better place. It's not working. I'm going to get high. I'm going to get high and just enjoy entertainment and drugs and then I'll finally be happy, but then I wake up the next day feeling worse. My hope is being a good person. My hope is I just want to live life without any regrets at the end, and I've gone to more deathbeds like that and they have regrets at the end. And the biggest one is I just hope that heaven is the end place for every person who was good and didn't hurt other people. And I want to tell you this morning, those are all dead hopes or dying hopes. One man said, all of our hopes have either died or they're dying. Good health, you're going to die. Gravity's going to win. Your body's going to give out. It isn't going to work. A marriage, you're going to say, my wife doesn't even like me. My children grew up to be knuckleheads, and they blame me for the, the reason the way they are. I, I want to be somebody, and, and if you take a bowl of water to see how significant you are, just put your hand in it and pull it out and see what, what you left. That's how significant we are. I want to make the world a better place. No. Alcohol and drugs slowly ruin your life, and you have to stay high so you don't have to face the mess that you made of your life. Being a good person, you haven't even lived up to your standard, much less God's standard. Living without any regrets is the recipe to have the most regrets on your deathbed. And that heaven is for everyone is an eternal mistake. It's an eternal lie that we're going to look at how to have a better hope than these things. So guys, every hope is either dead or dying. And this morning... I hear in 1 Peter something that just sounds so good and true to me. There's a hope that's living. And death only makes it more alive. It makes it even bigger and better. There's a hope that cannot die and it can't be taken away by anybody or any circumstance. It just gets brighter and brighter like the rising of the moon, midday sun. It just, it's a hope that grows and increases in your knowledge of Jesus Christ. So I have a hope for the hopeless this morning. And so if you'll journey with me, if you would just for a short time and maybe your whole life can make sense this morning, and you're going to be blessed with a living hope. And I've been praying for that all week for every soul here this morning. And so welcome to Southside Bible Church, home of the longest introductions in America. <laughs> and this could be yours every Sunday, baby. Yeah. Okay, I'm almost done with my introduction. No, let's get in the text. So your introduction, if I just summarized it, is your hopes are dying. And, and you're gonna, the longer you live, they're going to be taken away, one at a time, and you're going to be left hopeless. And I'm going to show you one that is never going to be taken away. And it just gets brighter and bigger and stronger. I, I pray that you're ready to hear what that hope is now. 1 Peter 1, 3, if it's up on the screen. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Peter's writing to a church that's suffering. They've been scattered. They've been kicked out of their own homes and persecuted. Uh, the emperor is about to bring one of the greatest persecutions that the church has ever known. His name is Nero, and he's going to start killing the Christians, and he's going to crucify them, and he's going to put them on fire and all these different things. And Peter's got to write a letter to a church that's going through that, and he's got to encourage them and give them hope of eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So if they kill you, uh, your hope is not going to be killed. And so Peter's going to write this letter, and he starts by reminding them of the truth of the gospel in the first 12 verses. So that's the section we're going to look at this morning, is what do we have in Jesus Christ? And what we have is a living hope. And so if you're ever going to suffer well and live under the hardships and all the mistreatments of this world, they hated Christ and they're going to hate everyone who follows after him. 
Have you ever wondered why you hate people who follow after Jesus Christ? This is why. We have to be uh, born again to have a living hope. Because if our hope was for this life only, if it, it would die when you're imprisoned or if you're waiting to be killed the next day, your hope would be over. And so there is a way to have a living hope, to look at our great salvation that we have in Christ. And so I just want to look at it with you in verse 3. First point that Peter brings up, he says, Blessed be the God, this is, he's praising him, he's worshiping God, who? The author of this great salvation. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So in the midst of all their suffering, the trials and fiery ordeals and the persecution, Peter's praising God. He's praising God in the midst of it. He's blessing the name of God in the midst of persecution. And this is when this goes from just some truth in your head to really getting the gospel. It goes from now just, oh, I believe this, I agree with this. No, I get this, and I can even suffer and praise God in the midst of it. When all you can do is worship and praise God for no matter what the circumstances are in your life, you get the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because it all is feeding and strengthening your living hope. There is nothing that can kill this hope. There is no circumstance that can come into your life that can kill this. There is no person who can kill this. There's no event, there's no loss that can take this from the believer in Jesus Christ. It's a living hope. It cannot die because it's in the living one who has been resurrected and this very morning is seated in victory at the right hand of God. This hope cannot die. This is so important because Peter just says, he doesn't, listen to what he doesn't say. Blessed be the God and Father, the Creator. You know, blessed be the God and Father, the, the Father of the Trinity. But he, he says, blessed, uh, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Peter looks at every aspect of our salvation, and what he says is it's, it's from God alone. God is the one who's authored this salvation. God is the one who has brought a salvation to mankind. Guys, I want you to hear this morning, this is God's plan. This is God's purpose, to bring a salvation to humankind. When Peter thinks of this God and who has brought about this salvation, he doesn't think of him in an undefined way. As our day and age, whatever you want to think God to be is okay. Peter can only bring it into this one realm. It isn't God and whatever you want him to be. Make up your own God. That is not it. Peter can only see one specific thing. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The relationship of the Father and Son as God. And as the Bible unfolds its storyline, we see that, that God promised a salvation to this world. And he says it's going to come a thousand years before by my son, and his name is going to be Emmanuel, which means God is with us. And the whole Old Testament, he just keeps showing pictures and promises of this one that he was going to send who would be fully God and fully man, and he would bring about a salvation for sinners. God would save the world through his son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Blessed be the God and Father who gave us his son to bring about his salvation. That's why Jesus said, I am not a way, I'm the way. I'm the truth, and I'm the only one that gives life. No one can come to the Father but through me. This is God's gift for salvation. Not a million different ways, not whatever you want it to be. It's God's plan, and it's God's Son that He sent into this world to save sinners among who I am foremost. The salvation that the Father has promised is through His Son. And in the fullness of the time, He sent forth His Son who was born of a virgin to come and to seek and to save that which was lost. To come, and I, I've said this so many times to the church, he came to live the life that God required of us. God requires perfection, guys, to be in his presence. You can't get there. So his son came and he lived the perfect life that the father demanded, and by grace, he will put that to your account. 
And then the soul that sins must die. So he sent his son to come and die the death that you deserved for your sins. And so Jesus Christ has come to do that. Men, women, and children, it is through Jesus Christ our Lord that God has chosen to bring salvation. For it is he who will save his people from their sins. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's why Peter stood in Acts for the second sermon he preached, there is no other name under heaven by which a man can be saved. God has given his Son for the purpose of salvation. Second point, I want to look then at the source of this salvation. So God is the one with the plan. Look at the source And verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy, his great mercy, the salvation was determined by the great mercy of God. And so our God is just. Our God cannot be but just or he's not God. And so he has to punish sin. He's a holy God. I got to punish sin or I'm not God. He's just. But what I want you to hear this morning is he's a merciful God. And so he's not just just, he's wise and he's merciful and he says, I have a way to relieve you of all of your misery and sin and no hopes and wallowing and trying to fix it and not being able to fix it and to end in eternal destruction. My mercy looks at you and I have a way, I have a plan to deliver you from this bondage and this pain and the destruction that sin brings into our lives. God is merciful. What is mercy? It's pity expressed in suitable action to relieve the misery. And so the heart of God has pity and says, I am going to relieve that misery. Hopeless human beings under the wrath of God who can't get it off. Morality can't get it off. All I did was I, I wallowed in it and I was destroying myself in it. I hurt everything and anything I touched in my sin. Uh, Paul said misery and destruction were in their path. That's what this was doing. Sin was killing and destroying us. And friends, we needed mercy. We needed a God, a creator of this world who was merciful. And we needed great mercy. Ephesians 2 says because he was rich in mercy. And so there's a heart in God that looked out at us. And he did something to remedy the problem. And I want to look then at our third point then is... The initiation into this great salvation. God has made a way of salvation. And he is the one who initiates it. If you'll look with me in verse 3. Who according to his great mercy. This is our God and Father. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope. And I know you're thinking, oh no, I knew it. He was one of those guys. He's too passionate about this. I'm surprised you don't have a a rainbow and a wig on with John 3.16 signs and all of that. One of those born-again weirdos. But I want you to hear something. Jesus said to Nicodemus, unless you're born again, you won't enter into the kingdom of God. So it isn't just crazies and weirdos. This is Jesus Christ saying, if you're going to enter into my kingdom, you got to be born again into it. The way you were born into this kingdom, this world, you were birthed. And you need to be birthed into the kingdom of God, which is called salvation. Uh, Relationship brought back to God. You must be born again. There's no other way into heaven, Jesus told Nicodemus. And so my friends, uh, God must birth you into the kingdom of heaven. So hear this. You can't just work at it. And you can't just try to grow into it and become a better person and clean up your life. That isn't how you get into the kingdom of God. you got to be birthed, not worked. Birthed. You can't merit your way into this kingdom. I love it. you got to come with empty hands. You can't come with all your good stuff and cleaning yourself up and becoming a better person. That's how you get out of the kingdom. That's your problem. That's what your, your hope is in that, and that's a dead hope. It's going to die when you stand before God. And so you you can't merit your way into it. You can't join the right church and get into it. You must be birthed by God himself into the kingdom 
of God. So I asked this when I preached it the first time, is how do you know that you were birthed? If you run back to where, where your birth certificate is and mine's in New York and go pull it out and show I'm birthed. No, the way you know you've been birthed is you're alive. You're sitting here this morning. Kendall, you were birthed, I think. And he's alive. So it's birth. And so the way I know if I've been birthed into the kingdom of God is I'm alive spiritually. When Adam sinned, you died spiritually. We're all stillborns spiritually when we come into the world. And so God's got to birth us into the kingdom of God. And hear this. God never brings a stillborn into his kingdom, ever. We all come into his kingdom alive, little Little happy babies, kicking, happy, beautiful. Now you got a, a heart, a born again heart that beats with love for Jesus Christ. In 1 Peter 1 8, it says, We don't see Jesus now, but what? We love him. And so this is how you know if you've been born again, is I got a heart now that loves Jesus Christ. It's not I'm religious, I'm moral, and I'm a nice guy. I've been born again, and I've got a heart that loves Jesus Christ. What what happened? I, I was birthed. And now my heart loves the one who hung on a cross in my place. I have lungs now that breathe to please this God. As obedient children, it says in 1 Peter 1, I just want to obey this God. What happened? All I wanted to do was disobey him and be God. And all of a sudden, something happened and I've been birthed and I just want to please this God. I have a belly now in 1 Peter 2, 1 through 3 that hungers and thirsts for the living word of God. Suddenly this dead Bible is alive and it reveals my Savior and I love it and I hunger and I thirst for the Word of God. I've been birthed. I I was dead spiritually and now I'm alive. I love Jesus and I want to please Him and I love His Word because it reveals Him. And then in 1 Peter 2, I've been birthed. He says there's a new temple and the cornerstone, the foundation of everything is Jesus Christ. So the way you know you've been born again is that you Look only to Jesus Christ for the life that he lived and the death that he died to be right with God. I've been born again because that's my only hope, is what Jesus Christ did. When he hung on that cross, he said, it is finished. And he meant, I've done everything necessary for salvation. If you come with an empty hand, I'll give it to you. And so my life now is built on Christ. I live for him. I love him. I seek to please him. He's my only way I'll ever stand before God loved and accepted. I'm never going to be good enough to look at me and say, oh, there's my hope. My hope just grows and grows in Jesus Christ alone. That's how you know if you've been born again. And I want you to hear that because too many people are in the church who are religious and moral and good guys, but you've never been born again by God to this God, the living Christ, where you're alive now spiritually and you know him and you love him and you want to please him. Have you experienced the new birth? This is what it means to be born again. Has it happened to you? You've got to answer this with judgment day honesty. If not, I want you to hear this very clearly. You have a dying hope. Whatever else you're holding to will die on the last day. Don't hold to being a good guy, please. Don't hold to that your parents were Christians or that you got baptized when you were five. You hold only to Jesus Christ the cornerstone. Religion is a dying hope. But I offer to you this morning the life of God and the soul of man. I offer you Jesus Christ who can make you one with God and he can make you alive to God. He can take spiritual stillborns and birth them into the kingdom of God. Can you say this morning with Peter, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Can you say that? He's your Lord, our Lord. You're my Lord. You're it, Jesus. I've been born again, and you're Lord, and I surrender. Can you say that with Peter this Lord's Day morning? Well, let me ask you this. What does this salvation birth us into? Look in verse 3. It births us again. You have been born again to a living hope. A hope that is certain and steadfast. The biblical word for hope is not, I hope the Broncos get better. It's, I, I'm certain. I absolutely know it. This is, a, this is something I'm banking my whole life on because it's certain. That's what hope is. So this is a living hope. I know. 
I have eternal life. When I go to my deathbed and I might be passing into eternity, I have hope and I have peace because I know the risen one, the living God. It, it, it was certain for Amanda. And it's a hope of eternal life in verse 4. It says that you've been born again to this, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. It's the only thing that won't go away, get old, or wear out. There's a place in heaven that lasts forever. God, through this resurrection where Jesus is now, uh, we will be brought to him. And in the last day, there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth. Guys, and we're going to dwell with him forever. And this is what I want you to bring all of Peter back together for the saints of God. You're going to have a living hope. In verses 6 through 9, it says you're going to get put in a furnace. And you're going to have trials. And they're going to boil off the impurities of your faith so that it says you're going to hope in God. Uh, verse 8 or 9, you're going to obtain as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. So even trials are going to come now, guys, and they're going to purify your hope of that day when I'll have no more trials and I'll be with him forever. It's a hope that will anchor your whole life and soul. In verse 13 of chapter 1, it says, fix your hope on the coming to you grace of God and Jesus Christ. That there, there is a Christ who's coming back and it could be this day. And so your whole life, believer, as you are waiting for Jesus Christ, Maranatha, come, come back. Would it be today? We live in expectation and hope every day. And now my life has purpose. My purpose is come back, Jesus. I'm living for that day. I have banked. It says fix your hope with finality. Don't bank it on something else. I, I want Jesus and Muhammad and a little bit of Mormonism. He's saying no. Finality. Jesus Christ alone is the only way you bank on it. You look for it. You fix your hope. On that, it's a hope that sets you free now to love other people and not use them. As an unbeliever, you can only use other people even when you're nice to them. It makes you feel better. Maybe you can gain an advantage with them. Guys, this gospel can set you free to love people genuinely because he first loved us and sent his son into this world. This hope makes me love like no other. It's a hope that's built into a community. He says, a living stone, Christ, with all these stones, we're in it. And now, guys, we're, we're bound together in community, and we have a hope together of what's coming. There's this beautiful brotherhood and sisterhood that we have in the body of Christ. We have a hope, Peter says, when the government comes against us, when society turns against us, when our bosses turn against us, when a husband turns against us, all of these things, you have a hope that can't be shaken. And, and, and we can hold to all the things in life that are going to come slap us and beat us and hit us down. As I, I've got a hope past every one of them. i got a hope, Peter says, that's within you. And, in, on a, and people on a, are going to come and they're going to say, what's the hope within you? So guys, this hope of this gospel, it isn't just some doctrinal thing. i got a hope that I'm going to live forever because Jesus Christ is risen. I have a hope that his work has brought me safely to God for all of eternity. I have this hope, and it's going to change everything about the way I think and what I live for, what I gather, what I hope in. And people are going to look at you, and they're going to have no explanation for you because they got dying hopes. Why, why do you have a living hope? Why are you so happy on Mondays? Why are you not living for retirement? What, what's wrong with you? Guys, we are called to be this because we have a living hope hope. And so this morning, the joy that you see on all these faces, when we were singing this morning, it was ridiculously beautiful. And we have a brother in our midst who's been battling liver cancer for a few years. We've had some couples in here who have had to bury children. We have some drugs that have shipwrecked families and hearts and lives. We've had some marriages turn toxic. We've had some people lose their jobs. Some people battling depression and loneliness, sin that is unrelenting. We have sickness and disease. We have some, some young ones, 19 and 20, battling lifetime diseases and different things like that. And they've come in here this morning with a joy because they have a living hope that this world didn't give to us, so the world can't take it away. It's a living hope that they have. And they're different than anyone else that I know in this world. They will not die no matter what comes 
against it. And I, I've faced many things in this journey, and I found this hope is indestructible. Nothing can separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Nothing. And this is so sweet, I want it for everyone in this room. I want you to have this hope. Pastor, how can you be so certain? How can you be so certain about this? How can you have a hope that doesn't die? Because we have a Savior who death could not hold him. It held everyone else who ever came into it. He was delivered up because of our transgressions. Because of our sins, he hung on a cross. And he was buried because the soul that sins must die. And he was raised for our justification, which means our being made right with God. So he was raised so that we can now be forgiven of our sins and have a relationship with the living God. He's alive. Peter says in verse 3, it is through, this living hope is through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Peter had lost all hope in this world and himself. Jesus was in a dead, dead in a tomb. And all of his hope, Peter put all of his hope on him. And now all of a sudden it just looked like another dead hope like everyone else. And so Jesus asked Peter, he said, Peter, who do you say I am before the crucifixion? And he says, you're the Christ You're the Lord's Messiah. You're the promised one who will bring salvation into the world. You're going to bring destruction to our enemies. You're going to cast down Rome, and Rome just killed you. You couldn't even save yourself. Our hope is gone. Our hope is dead, and our hope is buried. And Peter lost hope in himself. Jesus said earlier, he said, Peter, you're going to deny me three times before the night's out. No way. Even if I have to be destroyed, I will not deny you. If all these others fall away, I won't. Three times he denies them. He curses. I don't even know the man. And a rooster crows and Peter goes uh, destroyed. He's lost all of his hope. He's a devastated man. And maybe that's you this morning that you've walked in here and you've lost all hope. You've lost hope in yourself. You've denied him three times and you've lost hope in anything. And this morning, I want you to see that there's a living hope. They were hiding in an upper room, despairing and afraid, hopeless. And early Sunday morning, Mary comes running in and says, they've taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they have laid him. And Peter and John run to the tomb, and he's gone. And just as linen linen wrappings are lying on the floor, and they go back, and Jesus appears to Mary, and she goes back and she says, I have seen the Lord. And Peter finds then that he has risen just as he said he would do. And Peter's, his dead hope was now changed to a living hope, a hope that his own crucifixion, Peter's, couldn't take, take it away. So where do you get this new hope? Where do you get a living hope? Well, it's in Jesus Christ who died for your sins. Your sins have got to be forgiven. They've got to be justly punished. Jesus hung on a cross to bear the justice of God so that you could receive mercy this morning for those sins. That is the only hope. And that he was buried and he was raised to God to say it worked. It's finished. There's salvation in no other name. And now there's salvation in Jesus Christ, seated in victory. Hope is being restored back to God through the work of Jesus Christ. And ultimately, the whole cosmos is going to be restored to God and made right. And so, guys, this can't be Pollyanna theology. It can't be that hope is just that everything's going to work out. I used to do that. It doesn't. It has to get better. That's a dead, that's a dead hope. Guys, we need a living hope. And the resurrection is the guarantee because we are united to Christ that our dead bodies will live even if they die. We have eternal life now in Jesus Christ. We're attached to him, and we have this living hope that as certain as he is seated in victory, we're going to join him one day. And this is what we are alive to, people of God. This is our hope, and this is what we celebrate every day, especially on this Lord's Day. This is our blessed hope. My hope is as certain as the empty tomb, and my hope is as certain as Jesus Christ seated today. And victory.
So I want to close with some applications for two groups of people, and and I, I need you to wake up. It's Easter morning. Okay? Thank you. First, I want to address unbelievers, and then I want to address believers, and then you will be done. So unbelievers, and what I say by an unbeliever is this is someone who hasn't been born again. It doesn't matter if you nod to the truth and you've been in it your whole life. That isn't what I'm talking about. I'm talking about someone who's not been born again. And I want you to hear this clearly. There is a day coming when all of your false hopes are going to cease. And every one of us are going to have a day where we breathe our last breath unless Jesus Christ comes back. And you're going to stand before the living God. And there's going to be God, you, and your life. And you're going to stand before this holy, majestic, amazing God. And all of your false hopes that God just likes good people, I'm better than my neighbor, everything that you've ever held to is going to melt away in the presence of this God. And there's nothing you can do at that point. And then you're going to be cast into a place with a sign that says, abandon all hope, anyone who enters into this place. Hell is the only place where you can never hope again. You can, you, there's no hope that you'll ever get out of it, ever. The torment is forever. You can't hope for a better day. It's forever. A hopeless eternity. You can't afford to be wrong on this one. So this day I'm offering to you a living hope. I'm offering you God's remedy, His plan for your salvation. It's in Jesus Christ. He's been raised, and now He's endowed with salvation, and He'll give it to any who will throw down their false hopes and their false beliefs and come to Him and say, my Lord, my Lord, and believe in Him. And He says, you'll be saved. Are you tired of watching your hopes die one at a time? Are you really going to run after another dead one and think this one's going to work? Aren't you tired of trying to come up with new ones? Would this Easter morning you find a living hope who rose from the grave and he had victory over sin and death and now he gives eternal life to all who will come and believe. We're going to have pastors up front at the end of the service We will talk with you more if you want to talk about your soul or if you've come with someone. Deal with this. But what I'm asking this morning is don't let this sit. Don't ignore it and don't dismiss it easily. Don't go eat a bunch of ham and celebrate the one who's going to be your judge if you don't bow to him today. And so I'm asking you to deal with this with judgment day honesty. Have you been born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ? And then I want to address the believer in Christ, the one who has been born again by this truth. Have you let your hope drift into a dead hope? Have you let it drift into maybe it is marriage, that the church loves to exalt certain things over Jesus? Maybe, maybe you've made your hope your marriage, uh, children, protection from loss. Maybe it has become your health. Some hope to try to control God. And live a certain way so he owes you something. We suffer so little in comparison to third world countries that our hope starts to grow, kind of grow back into the wrong things in this world. And so this morning, I want you to fight it. The whole gospel is bringing us to this place where we've labored in Peter for over a year, and, and the fruit of what I want for this congregation is a living hope. I don't want us to play religion. I don't want us to gather together and say we did church. I want this to be a church of people with a living hope. And it flows and floods into everything we say and do. And we don't spend all of our days running away from it, but running to it. Don't give all your efforts to avoid death day. Run to it. Run to it and hold to Jesus and our hope. We've had to bury two saints this year who got to glory. This morning, their Easter is way better than ours. And I want you to get this, and I want you to hold to it and not let it go. Let it be within you. And so this morning, I want to bring us all back to this Easter morning 
and I want us to come back to an empty grave, and I just want to remind every one of you, you have a living hope, you have an eternal inheritance that will not fade away, imperishable and undefiled, reserved in heaven for you because Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. He is risen. He is risen. He is risen. And I want to do one more thing for me, is I'm going to say, I will rise, and I want you to say, I will rise indeed. I will rise. I will rise indeed. I will rise. I will rise indeed. I will rise. I will rise indeed. Guys, we are going to rise to life forever because we are attached to Jesus Christ, and death could not hold him. And as certain as he is in victory, we will stand in victory with him. Let that change and transform your lives and everything about you. I have a living hope that nothing can take it away. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God, we thank you for a living hope. I thank you for Jesus Christ. God, I thank you that you had a plan. You, you had a plan to save sinners through your son. And this plan is glorious, that it revealed your holiness and your justice by putting your own son on a cross and you would not spare him, but you delivered him up for us all. You took the sword of justice and you pierced him through again and again on that cross so that now you can embrace us and wash us and cleanse us and forgive us of our sins. God, thank you for the remedy for sin that no man can find except in Jesus Christ. God, I pray let every soul in this room call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved.